House of Israel International Services are held weekly at 3601 Rose Lake Drive, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28217, 11 a.m. Saturday mornings and 7 p.m. Thursday evenings, Eastern Time. This live broadcast is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Your financial support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Motivating. Inspiring. Challenging. Encouraging. Deepening. Strengthening and enhancing your faith. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to House of Israel International's live worship service. I hope you got something to write with, something to write on, because we are about to go on a marathon in the Word. Amen? Pulling down strongholds, this is part three. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1, and if you haven't seen or listened to uh, part 1 and part 2, I encourage you sometime today to do that because we're not going to go back over any of that, but we are going to look at the foundational scripture for what we are dealing with here. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I'm present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. If we can get the believers to know this. Though we are human beings, our weapons are not human weapons. There's an authority, a power in the spirit that you and I have that is not parallel to anything on the earth. I'm telling you, when you know and embrace who you are, you will become a powerful force that can transform whatever environment you go into. You see, Yeshua, the Bible says that when he went into certain places, those spirits that were manifest there, they had been there the entire time. I'm not, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me Spiritually, now I, I must say it does bother me humanly when, when people get aggressive and begin to attack me. What's interesting is that people can't, they, they don't attack me from a word perspective. They attack me in other areas. I use Christ. Well, you know, Christ is in the King James Bible that I read from. I use Jesus. I say the Lord. I, I dress like a Pentecostal priest. Listen, before Pentecostalism ever was on the planet, people dressed nice. You don't dress like a Messianic. You don't use enough Hebrew. I mean, you want to come at me like that, that's okay. You see. But when it comes down to the word, that's, the, that's where we should be judging people. And what I mean by judging them, I'm not talking about judging unto condemnation, but judging to see if that which they are speaking is from the Almighty. You got people who say, listen, you shouldn't be judging. But wait a minute. The Bible says, listen, if there's going to be prophecy, let one or two speak and let the other ones judge. The whole gifting of discernment is discerning the spirit that is on what you are saying. That means that if I'm going to exercise the spirit or gift of discernment, I got to make some judgments. If I'm going to test the spirit by which you operate in, I got to do some judging. You see. If you're saying some stuff that don't align up with the scripture, how am I going to know that if I don't judge what you're saying? So I'm supposed to judge. I'm not to pass judgment unless, of course, I'm in a court of law. And in the Bible, when the believers come together and there is a dispute among them, there's a time when we have to judge. 
Paul writes to us and says, listen, you all take your matters to the court system, the human secular court, when you should be bringing your matter among the believers. Aren't there some spiritual people among you who have the ability to judge a matter? Why are you taking your stuff down there to those secular judges? They're not going to judge according to the word. So you got people who don't want you to judge while judging. Listen, we aren't backing down. You can call us a court and you know a, a cult, and you know what we'll say? Yes, we are. Now, I know that's a bad word for some people, but every religious system out there is a cult. Anybody who's listening to anybody who has any system is a cult. So don't back up off of that. Well, you're legalistic. You darn right I'm legalistic because the book of the law is a legal book. Covenants are legal. You cannot be in the Bible and not be legalistic. So, so w w you're not going to back us up off of, off of using languages to try to demonize. and call, Oh, you think you're holy? Yes, I do. We're called to be holy. Oh, you think you're holier than thou? Well, if you're not operating in the word, yes, I am holier than thou. <laughs> Got to flip the, flip the script. Stop letting the world back you up. Listen, the Bible says that a, a, a natural-minded man cannot understand spiritual things. If you're going to walk by the Spirit, walk in the spirit, you will not be understood by the world. In order for you to be understood by the world, you got to operate on a world mentality. And you don't want to do that because that makes you worldly. Hallelujah. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Messiah. See, I said Messiah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, next week, as I said, we're going to be talking about strongholds and how to free ourselves from them so that we can actually be free indeed. And that's what you want, is you want to be free indeed. Today, we're going to talk about how strongholds develop and what you can do to avoid strongholds from being developed in your life. You can avoid strongholds from being developed. The word we note as stronghold is the word akuroma, from a remote derivative of echo, meaning to fortify through the idea of holding safely a castle, and then figurative, an argument. An argument. So additional meanings of this word is a castle, a stronghold, a fortress, anything on which one relies of the arguments and reasonings by which a disputant endeavors to fortify his or her opinion and defend it against his opponent. Origin from a remote derivative meaning to fortify through the idea of holding safely. Strongholds we talked about are very dangerous because they cause us to operate in areas that are opposed to Jehovah to satisfy the will of the flesh or of our carnal nature. Strongholds would develop a system and these are excuses or reasonings of justification or Department of Defense to maintain its operation and to advance grounds within order to have a lifetime habitation. And so many of the ideas that you hold firm to are the results of tried and tested systems because over the course of our lives, we've made adjustments in our thinking. To a point to where, you know, this is just the way I am. You hear people say, well, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Why can't you teach an old dog new tricks? Because the old dog has developed strongholds, and that's just the way the old dog is. The old dog is not willing to change. You understand? 
When a stronghold has been developed, we do whatever we need to do to protect, defend our reasonings or irrational desires. Again, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The word catharsis means pulling down. It's actually demolishing. That's what it means to demolish. To pull down a stronghold, one first must acknowledge a stronghold has been developed. And this is tough for some people. I remember, um, and those of you who have gone through any form of rehabilitation, for me, it was rehabilitation from the use of, of cocaine and, and, and alcohol and going through a rehabilitation center and learning the tools that are important to maintain one's freedom. One of the things that they taught is that, you know, if you're ever an addict, you're, you're always an addict. Shortly after becoming born again, as I understood it, I had to denounce that idea. There's still many who say, well, you know, if, you've, if you're an addict, you're, you're always an addict. There is a commercial on now that, you know, if you've ever had uh, some, I think it was um, uh, chicken pox or measles or something, the shingle virus is inside you. What is it? Shingles. But what is, the, what is it that is it was chicken pox? You know, if you've ever had the chicken pox, the shingle virus is inside you. Really? So, you know, anybody who has chicken pox, after you hear those words, what do you think? Oh, the shingle virus is inside me. So you are now making a, you're making a confession, inviting shingles into your life based on what a commercial said. You understand what I'm saying? The shingles virus is inside me. So every time you look around, you see a little, oh, it must be shingles. <laughs> Seek your physician. Ask them if this medication is right for you. Now, never mind the fact that it's going to cause your nose to bleed. You might go blind. You'll lose your hearing in one ear. You become suicidal. Forget all that. Just, just talk to your doctor. But that's what it's come down to, ladies and gentlemen. And we're making decisions not even realizing that much of the decisions that we're making is based on what we hear, what people say to us, because most people trust the professionals. The reason why modern-day deliverance is only temporary. How many of you have ever gone through some form of deliverance? How many of you have ever been to a deliverance ministry, been part of deliverance ministry? One of the things that I learned early on, because, you know, I was part of a ministry that before the service, they would bring out all these Kentucky Fried Chicken buckets, you know, the big buckets, the KFCs, or they get some plastic buckets from the dollar store, and there would be buckets lined up all along the altar, and people would come up, and they start casting demons out, expecting people to break wind, to cry, to, 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 to spit, to throw up, and all this kind of stuff. Anybody ever been to that degree? Really? Y'all ain't been in a bucket church? Oh, man. We got what? Oh, yeah, they bring the buckets out, man. You going to throw up. You going to spit up. If nothing else, you going you go, you go, you go to cough something up. Otherwise, you still got that demon. And they tell you, come out, come out. <laughs> they call it a loud, high-pitched sound, shrieking sound. One lady, I won't mention her name. She was a professional deliverance ministry. And her claim to fame was that shriek. Get I guess she was she was into vibrations or something. You know, that only thing the demons respond to is that is that sound. And folks trying to mimic her. You know, anyway, there's a lot of shrieking going on in that place. But they would have the buckets and people would line up. And, you know, once you got rid of one demon, you had more demons. And 
Next week, they had another deliverance service, and pretty soon, you know, the pastor and all the elders, you know, are constantly coming up for deliverance. I realized, you know, why they kept coming up for deliverance, because as soon as they come up for deliverance, they went back to some of the stuff that they were doing, and now they needed to be delivered again. But the reason why modern-day deliverance is only temporary is because it deals with the symptoms and not the root. But people say they're dealing with the root and they get into inner healing. You know, it almost always go back to your dad's relationship. You must have had a, 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 rela a bad relationship with your father. I'm telling you, almost every, it, it would, it's almost impossible to go through any form of deliverance without it coming back to you and your dad's relationship. Because this is for, oh, the sins of the father. I'm also amazed how deliverance ministry dance around the Torah, use the Torah, but don't apply the Torah. So it masks, it's, it's, it, it masks the root by addressing generational curses, inner healing, but it never deal with the real root. And we're going to look at that. You see, we can focus on the deliverance needed or we can focus on why deliverance is needed. You can say, well, you know, the person needs deliverance, and the question is why? Why is it that someone needs deliverance? And why is it that people tend to always need deliverance from something or another? Because as we're talking about strongholds, you're going to see deliverance is needed because of strongholds, because of bondage, because of captivity or, or slavery. You know, and you'll find that when Israel came out of Egypt, they brought Egypt with them. When people came out of slavery, they brought slavery with them. Every immigrant who have come to this country has brought, have brought their nationality, their culture, their traditions, their beliefs with them. And it causes individuals to create enclaves to where they try to preserve this culture. They try to preserve their traditions within the enclave that they, that they move into. Well, it's the same thing with, you know, the South. The South had traditions of, of, of slavery and you have whites and you have blacks and you have a community to where the blacks live over here and the whites live over there and, and the Hispanics weren't allowed, you know. They were migrant workers. You hid them in the woods somewhere. See what's going on, folks. And then, you know, Asians begin to come in and now you got an Asian community. You got Chinatown. You got Germantown. You got Italian town. You got Jewtown. And then it shows up in the church because you got the black church, you got the white church, you got the Hispanic church, you got the Asian church, you got the Jewish synagogue. And throughout the culture, these strongholds and these traditions are continually protected to be maintained and preserved for the generations to come. And anyone who rebelled against those traditions, they are now rebellious. There's something going on in the earth today where, you know, there's a big case out in California where they're talking about measles. And they're finally acknowledging that the whole vaccination, the whole vaccination of human beings is a herd mentality. That the only way this thing is going to work is that all the people buy into it. It's a herd mindset. And so now you got folks who don't want to be vaccinated vaccinating their children, fighting with people, or people who have their children vaccinated, fighting with people whose children are not being vaccinated. So now some people have broken away from the herd. And as a result of this herd mindset, the government has to step in and to try to bring some order and legitimacy to where at some point they're going to want to try to force everyone to follow the herd. It's coming. Well, this has been going on for a long, long, long time. And there are strongholds that have been developed in us because of this whole
herd mindset that was literally ushered in through the Constitution. When you begin to talk about and think about how we as a people operate and think, there are two entities in the earth that has governed thought. One, the first institution was the religious institution. Because when religion came to this country, religion came to this country to escape tyranny. Or the people came to this country to es escape tyranny, but they brought their religion with them. And so now we're going to create this document to declare our independence. The Declaration of Independence. And then there was this idea based on something Thomas Jefferson wrote concerning putting a wall or a hedge between the church and state. So the idea of a separation of church and state was instituted. Now, understand something, that one way of getting morals instituted in this nation is through government. Government de decides what is legal and what is illegal what is moral and what is immoral. The other institution is the church. So you got the church and the state that are looking at two different documents. The church is identifying morality and immorality from the Bible. The government is establishing immorality and morality from the Constitution by its interpretation to establish laws to govern the people of the nation. So at some point, government says it's illegal for you to have sex with your donkey. And they write law. And then people gather together and says, you know what? I don't like that law. So let's say it repealing it like Obamacare. We're going to make it our job to repeal the law. So if I want to have sex with my ass, I mean my donkey, I can have sex with my donkey. Now I know, listen, the children don't need to cover their ears because this is serious. If I want to have sex with my donkey and we get enough people in this democratic society to, to, to pick it, to, to, to march, to demonstrate, to lobby, then we get Congress to pass a law or to, let's say, abolish that law. They don't make a law that it's okay for you to have sex with your donkey. They just abolish the law that says you can. Now, the, the, the word says it's wrong, but government says it's okay. So now, if the government says it's okay, then the voice of the church, the voice of the religious people can become silent if the government is really running things. Because if a religious institution that is getting its identity from the government through its organizational papers that want to maintain its tax exemption status, they now get a little quiet because they don't want to draw attention from the government, the ire of the government that comes in and threaten to take away their tax exemption. I'm going to tell you how strongholds have been developed. I know this seems so far off from you. Alcohol. Illegal. Now, it's legal. The, only, the last bastion, there's still one state that I'm aware of in the United States, which is in Lancaster, South Carolina, that they still have the Sunday Blue Law. It's one of the last bastions to where now in every state that I know of, unless you know of a state that I'm not aware of, to where you can buy alcohol on Sunday when it used to be you couldn't even buy alcohol, period. Prohibition. Now, alcohol is able to be purchased. Marijuana. Marijuana used to be taboo, it used to be illegal, but now certain states 
have decided that it's no longer taboo and it is, it is legal and that's going to spread across the country. Homosexuality. You see, all of these things that the Bible talks about when Congress, when, 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 the, when the Constitution and those who are making laws are establishing law or they are taking what used to be laws off the books by instituting new laws, now our society and its moral compass is being established by those in Washington. Well, how does that come down to you and I? The bottom line is, is that when the government says it's legal, the argument that you and I have had about it being illegal is no longer valid. There are people who have been trying to argue religious values from a government legal perspective. Well, now that argument is gone. I can't tell my son you can't smell, smoke marijuana if he's in Colorado. Can't tell him it's illegal. That's the reason you shouldn't. You'll go to jail. No, he won't. Not anymore. And once a person gets of a certain age, they can drink. People can do the things that they want to do. Well, that's a mindset that people have established, and therefore it's my right because government has given me this right. You see, those who follow Jehovah look to this book of the law. Those who are of this world look to the law. So you got politics that are writing law, and you got Jehovah, who is the creator of all things, who have given us law. Now, when the politics writes law, because here's what, what's happened, that religious people have, have, have identified, because I was on this track, that if you want to make a difference in your community, then you now have to petition your representatives. You have to petition your congressmen. You might even have to write a letter to the, to the president of the United States. Well, if we want to have a greater impact, what we have to do is start telling the people in our churches, you need to think about serving, being a servant in your community in the political arena. You need to start running for offices. You need to get involved in government. And so the politicians start coming to the churches. And so just as you got the two house in Washington, you got the Senate and the Congress or the Senate and the, and the House of Representatives. You got two houses in churches. The main two houses is not Judah and Ephraim. It's Republican and Democrat Christians. So you got Republicans who are conservative, Democrats who are liberal, and they're all sitting in the same place. Politicians come in, preach to them, minister to them, get them out to the polls to vote so they can vote. And pretty soon what you have is you have people trying to legislate morality instead of preaching what thus saith Jehovah. Take it to another extreme. If we can get the church to come to the conclusion that the law of God is no longer valid, now you've just thrown the moral compass out of the window. So now our churches are full with young progressives. We've got a generation who's coming to church and all they want to do is sing songs and sing kumbaya and go to camps. That's what they want to do. Go to camp, have a meeting, play games. Don't preach to me about sin. So the mega church arises. And you got people who are teaching grace. We're not under the law. Grace, brother. Grace. God is a God of love. His mercy endures forever. We're saved by grace. And pretty soon, morality goes out the window. There is no morality happening. Today, we've got mega church ministers. Jakes, Dollars, Myers, all of these individuals who are now preaching, you don't even have to keep the Ten Commandments. 
That's what's happening. And it's filtering into the Messianic communities because Messianics are too busy trying to look Jewish. Let me get to some word. Now, I've been preaching all, all the time. I just haven't given you scripture. But let me give you some scripture. It's from, hey, when you go, when you go read from the Bible. Let me get to the Bible. Hallelujah. Oh, that's it. Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of Jehovah is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives, to preach deliverance to the captives. Now, these words in itself says that Yeshua has a mission to preach deliverance to the captives. He came to his own. What is he saying is, is that Judah, at this point and beyond, Judah is in captivity. Now, those of us who know our Bible, we know that Judah was under Roman rule. Is that right or not? Did they have the right to, to, to institute law? Did the Jewish people have a right to institute law? Could they even carry out their own law? No, they couldn't. Now, I want you to see this because this is important for you to pay attention to. They couldn't even institute the death penalty without approval. Okay? So he came to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now this word that we use here is the word aphesis, release from bondage or imprisonment, forgiveness or pardon of sins, letting them go as if they had never been committed remission of the penalty. And then the word captives here is akimalatos, meaning a captive properly, a prisoner of war, generally a person who is captive. Now, he wasn't talking about emptying out the jails. The deliverance that he was bringing, as it was interpreted by some, and deliverance of the captives, we're dealing with the mindset here. It's what he's dealing with. He's dealing with the mindset. And you're going to see this mindset play out. To preach the acceptable year of Jehovah, and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down in the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. What is he saying? The deliverer has come. The deliverer is here. Those of you who want to be delivered, deliverance is right now at hand. While speaking to some who believed on him, and Yeshua, Yeshua said in John chapter 8, as he spoke these words, many believed on him. Get that, I didn't underline and bold it, but I want to point it out. Many believed on him. Then said Yeshua to those Jews which believed on him. So who is he talking to? He's not just talking to Jewish people. He's talking to Jews who believe. These are Jewish believers that he's talking to. Why? Because it says that he, to those Jews which believed on him. Now, now let, that, let that percolate. <laughs> then said Yeshua to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue. In my word. If you continue. You believe now. You need to continue. See this ain't no once saved always saved. He's saying you believed on me. But if you continue in my word. Then. Are you my disciples indeed. 
So there were those who believed on him who chose not to be disciples. Because he'd already said earlier in John chapter 6 that many of his disciples followed him no more after he preached a certain sermon. And you shall know the truth. You see, it's the disciples, it's not the believers. He says, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now look at what they said. They answered him. We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. Now you're under Roman rule. How can you make these statements? Let me tell you something. There's a mindset among people, and especially young people, people will tell you they think for themselves. No, you don't. You think you think for yourself. You don't think for yourself. You've been trained to think. You've created systems of thought based on your experiences in life. And when you get in this environment, you think a certain way. And you get in this environment, and you think another way. I never understood until it was pointed out to me. I didn't even know I was doing it. I get around a person who had a foreign accent. I started talking different. Still talk English, but trying to talk in a way that hopefully they would understand. You ever, you ever, you ever talk to a person who had a heavy accent and you found yourself talking with an accent? Has that ever happened to anybody in here but me? Come on. That we be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How say you, you shall shall be made free? Basically, they're saying that they're free. Now, Yeshua said, I've come to set the captives free. Indicating that they are not free. Knowing that they're under Roman rule. They They can't even crucify him without Roman authority approval. Yeshua answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And then look at this. He acknowledged the fact. He says, I know that you are Abraham's seed. Did he say they weren't? No. He says, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. Now, who is he talking to? He's talking to them that believed on him. Let's not lose the context. He's talking to them that believed on him. He says, I know who you are. You believe on me, but you need to understand belief is not enough. You must continue in my word. Then you will be my disciple, and then you will know the truth, and then you will be set free If you continue in my word, belief is not enough. You got believers who are in bondage. People who claim to be filled with the Holy Ghost in bondage. I know you're Abraham's seed. Not denying that, but you seek to kill me. Why? Because my word has no place in you. All you do is believe. Who is he talking to? Them that believe on him. He says, yeah, you believe in me. You believe on me. But you won't let the words that I'm speaking in you. You got people who believe in the man, Jesus. But see, the man is the word that became flesh. That's who the man is. The man is the word which was with Jehovah in the beginning. And so you got people who believe on him but won't allow his word in them. And this is key because you can tell me what you want to tell me. But if the word is in you, that's how we know you are a disciple 
because the word is in you. The word is going to govern your life. You're going to live your life according to the word that's in you. You're going to live your life according to the word that is in you. So people who are claiming to be believers, who are living their lives contrary to the word, is an indication that they believe on him, but the word is not in them. Because you will live your life according to the word that is in you. He says, my word has no place in you. Who is he talking to? He's talking to them that believe on him. But it gets deeper. I speak that which I have seen with my father and you do that which you have seen with your father oh it's about to get ugly see you say we brothers but we got two different fathers when Yeshua says my brothers my sisters they are those who do the will of my father see just cause you claim to be a Jew just because you claim to be a believer, your works will tell me who your daddy is. You'll know them by their fruit, not by their confession. Too many people watching confessions and testimonies. See, it's good to, get, to have a testimony, but let's look at your life. Does your testimony align itself with your life? Now, when people talk about their testimony, they died and went to heaven and they saw all kinds of wonderful things in heaven. You know, that's a testimony you can't prove. You can't, you can't, you can't judge that testimony because I can't say you didn't die and you didn't go to heaven and you didn't see the things that you say you saw. Can't say that. Can't say you haven't seen the Lord. But I know this, everybody that I read about that have seen him, there is a transformation in them. He says, you do that which you've seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Yeshua said unto them, if. Now what did he say? He says, I know that you are Abraham's seed. I'm not denying that you are descendants of Abraham. You see, there are men who have children who are not fathers. They're just an organ donor. Or a sperm donor, if you would. They donated some sperm, and a child became the result of the sperm that was donated. You see, a father is different than a man who is who has children. Because that father is going to be looking out for the best interest of those children and making sure that those children have everything that they need in order for them to grow up in an environment where it's safe, where they are protected, where they can be nourished, where they will flourish, and where they become good citizens in society. A father is a responsibility. Anybody can be a dad. Any man can be a dad. But a father is something totally different than somebody who gave sperm. He says, if you were Abraham's children. See, there's a difference be between being a seed and a child. He's saying, I know you're seeds of Abraham. In other words, you came from the line of Abraham, but you're not looking to Abraham as your example. You're looking to something else. You're looking to Tupac. Biggest Smalls or Oh, those are old school. Whoever the new school people are today. You got your favorite rapper. That's your daddy. Why? Because you're trying to imitate him. You're trying to be like them. How are you going to be like them and claim to be of him? 
This is exactly what these hypocrites are doing. Oh, I'm slamming today, and I ain't taking no prisoners. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So how are we going to know you Abraham's children? By your works. How are we going to know you're children of the Almighty? By your works. You can tell me what you want to tell me. I'm not denying your daddy is who you say he is. But who's your father? Who's your father? You see, for a long time, I was T.C. Bailey's boy. That's who I was. Oh, that's T.C.'s boy. Oh, that's T.C.'s boy. You see, but at some point, I had to make a decision that now I had to take on the identity of my father who is in heaven because my earthly father was a drunk. Nice man, loved him, but he was an alcoholic. He was a gambler. He was a wife beater. He was a whoremonger. He liked hanging out in bars and getting drunk and gambling and chasing women. And until I denounced that father, that's exactly what I had become. Now I find myself in a drug rehabilitation center trying to get delivered from alcohol, from drugs, from whoremongering. And the only deliverance for me was to denounce that father and embrace this father. So now T.C. Bailey is not my dad. I mean, my father, he's my dad. Before he was my father, but now he was, he's just my dad. See, my father is in heaven. Where your father at? Who's your father? Yeshua says, listen, I'm doing the will of my father. Whose will are you doing? Oh, I can tell about what, you, what I see. You're doing the will of your father. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I've heard of. I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Abraham didn't do that. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. What are they saying? They say, we know you're a bastard. We know that Joseph is not your daddy. We know that your mama went somewhere and got pregnant. We know you're talking about that immaculate conception. There ain't no such thing as an immaculate conception. Your mama was a hoe. That's what they said. Let's just break it down. That's what they said. And you can nice it up and you can theologically exegete and dispute. See? But that's exactly what they're saying. We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Now, wait a minute. You say Abraham is your father. Now you're saying God is your father. And then he says, listen, see, y'all confused. He said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. He said, what, if Abraham was your father? What did, what did he say? You would do the works of Abraham. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Not only did the word not was, was not in them, but they didn't even have ears to hear. You are of your father the devil. Make a long story short. Now I know who my father is. You think you know who your father is, but let me tell you who your daddy is. Your father is the devil. How? How do I know that? Because the works you're doing. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer. He's calling them out. You've been trying to kill me. Why? Because your dad is a murderer. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Let's jump over to John, 1 John. And hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 
He that says I know him and keep it not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. What about these people who talk about I love God but reject his commandments? These are the same folks you sure was talking to. Oh, I know you. I know your daddy. I know you come from, from this family and you come from that family and, and you're part of that denomination. But let's look at your works. You see, Satan is the father of lies. Of lies. If you say you love me and you don't keep my commandments, what does that make you? That makes you a liar. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Oh, I know it stings, but I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just putting it all together. Satan was the father of lies, and those who say they love God and don't keep his commandments is a liar. And Satan is the father of lies, and those who say they love God and don't keep his commandments is a liar. So who are they following? The same Satan that the religious people of Yeshua's day was following with their religious institutions. Y'all ready to turn a corner? Because I'm about ready to turn a corner up in here. But whosoever keepeth this word in him, verily is the love of God, perfected hereby, know we that we are in him. When Solomon had completed the temple, he prayed and afterwards had a visitation from the Almighty. 2 Chronicles 6.36 If they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captives unto a land far off or near, Yet, if they bethink themselves in the land whither they are carried captive and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whether they have carried them captives and pray toward this land, which thou gavest unto their fathers and toward the city, which thou have chosen, and toward the house which I have built for thy name, then hear thee from the heavens, even from thy dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people which have sinned against thee. This prayer that Solomon prayed has been interpreted by some men to mean praying toward the east. Now, he never said pray toward the east. But what he did say, if you pray toward this land, if you pray toward this city, which you have chosen, if they, toward the house, which I have built. So how does that interpret to being praying to the east? Because there are a lot of messianics every Sabbath, every time they gather. And it's, it's, it's hard. I'm sitting in a, in a large gathering and everybody's praying. It's turning toward the east. And, you know, now you got that herd mentality. How do you not turn toward the east when everybody's turning toward the east and they're looking at you? That's the time to exit stage left. If I'd seen it coming, I never would have been in the, in the first place. I would have waited till after the prayer. What I can't get is these individuals who swear you're supposed to pray toward east, they pray congregationally, and then when they're done praying congregationally and they get to praying in the word, and now they want to have a prayer, before they deliver the word and they don't pray toward the east. And then after they've delivered the word and then they want to bless the people and pronounce the benediction, why don't y'all just turn toward the east? You understand what I'm saying? You're going to pray. If, if, if when you pray, you have to pray toward the east, then how is it that some prayers are toward the east and other prayers don't have to be prayed? That's hypocrisy. But I got one for you. What if Jerusalem is toward the north? Or the south? Do you understand what I'm saying? What are you going to do now? See? Now, you know, with the world being round... <laughs> You know, you could turn this way and you go eventually, you go, your prayers just go around. You know, you turn it this way, but your prayers is going this way. 
It's like, wait a minute, why did you just turn that way? But the point is, is that's not what he's saying here. But let's look at some. Now, because I'm going to tell you, among, among Christians, this is one of the most famous passages in the Bible that we're about to look at. Now, when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Also, at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, a very great congregation from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of e Egypt. Here we see that they kept the feast seven days, and there is a word. Looked like I put my, well, anyway. He kept the feast seven days and all Israel with him. Now, when Solomon had made an end of praying and the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Also, at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days and all Israel with him. And a very great congregation from the inner end of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. There's a place in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 where it talks about that he dedicated. I thought I'd put that in there, but obviously it got overlooked. Can somebody find 2 Chronicles? Because I don't want to miss this. It's verse 9. Verse 9. You all got a microphone back there in a the Bible because I want to I want to read this. Because somehow I put the word there and left out the verse. Enemy think he slick. I'm telling you, man, it's like who's got the, can I can I get a microphone or or maybe I'll just find it on my. What does it say? Please read it. And on the eighth day, they heard a sacred assembly where they observed the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast those seven days. Read that again, please. And on the eighth day. On they, the eighth day. They held a sacred assembly. They held a sacred assembly. Where they observed the dedication of the altar seven days. So they observed the dedication of the altar seven days. And the feast seven days. And the feast seven days. So there's seven days that they observed the dedication of the altar. And then there was an, an additional seven days that they observed the feast. And then on the eighth day, they had a sacred assembly. Anybody tell me what feast that is? That's Sukkot. That's exactly what it is. Look at him. He just threw that head up there. Jack's boy just threw that head up there. <laughs> That's Sukkot. Solomon is celebrating Sukkot for seven days and the last great day, Shemini Atzeret, which is the eighth day of sacred assembly after they celebrated Hanukkah, which is the dedication of the altar. Now, I know people that made Hanukkah the Maccabean. That was a Hanukkah where there is the rededication of the altar. The first Hanukkah was when they dedicated the altar for the tabernacle. The second Hanukkah is when Solomon dedicated the altar for the temple. The third Hanukkah is when they rededicated the altar after the Maccabean War. But let's look at this. They did the dedication. And on the 3 and 20th day, of the seventh month, he sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in heart for the goodness that Jehovah had shown unto David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. Thus Solomon finished the house of Jehovah and the king's house and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of Jehovah and in his own house, he prosperously affected. And Jehovah appeared to Solomon by night. And said unto him, I have heard your prayer. Now Solomon says some specific prayers. Let's go back to it. Because this is what he said. He says if they, if they, they, 
if they are carried into captive, into ca if they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them over into, over before their enemies. So what is Solomon saying? He's saying, listen, in order for the people to go into captivity, Jehovah has to send them. Now, this is important, ladies and gentlemen. See, you can't go into captivity. You can't go into bondage unless the Almighty sends you or allow you, which is really one and the same. Every bondage, every captivity you go into, the way of thinking, strongholds, all of it, is you have been allowed to formulate your own thinking, your own way of seeing things and doing things, while at the same time, the word of Jehovah is coming at you. But the question is, is are you allowing the word to come in you? Are you simply a believer in the Almighty or are you allowing his word to reside in you, which is going to transform you, which is going to cause you now to live your life according to the word so that when people see you, they now know that your life is reflective of the word because they see the word alive in you. Or are you just a believer? See, there's a lot of believers who don't have the word in them. And the thing that keeps you from going into bondage in the first place is the word of Jehovah. Now, this is important because I'm going to tell you something. You can get delivered and the word still not be in you and you're, you're going back into bondage. You can get delivered and the word not be in you, and guess what? You're going back into bondage. You're going back into captivity. And what causes a person to continue to do what they have been doing, even though they've been delivered? It's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. If you don't renew, oops, I'm getting into next week's message. There has to be a change in the way you think if there's going to be a change in how you live. So I can look at how you live and tell you how you think. Because whatsoever is in a man's heart or whatsoever a man thinketh, so is he. You're going to live how you believe. You can tell me what you, who you, what you believe in but you'll show me what you believe. I'll see what you believe by how you live. You can't hide that. You can tell me anything. So he says, if you get angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away. You see, once, once you get delivered into your enemy, your enemy, you become your enemy's property. There are people who claim to be Jehovah's property, but they're actually the property of their enemy because they've given place to their enemy. They've compromised. They've, they've, they've made a truce. They've allowed their enemy ground. The enemy takes them captive. You become a slave. You're in bondage. And so he says, you know, I've heard your prayers. And Jehovah appeared to Solomon and said unto him, I've heard your prayers and have chosen this place. I chose this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. Now, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts, who's shutting up heaven? The devil can't shut heaven. The devil have no control over the locusts. Now, I know the locusts might look like demons, 
But the devil has no control over the locusts. He has no control over the rain. He has no control over the pestilence. He says, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, why would you do that, Jehovah? Why would you shut up the heavens? Why would you send pestilence? Why would you, why would, if the locusts devour the land, the crops are not going to make it. The animals that depend on the crops are going to die. The people who depend on the animals and the crops are going to die. How could you allow that? You see, this has come, caused some people to say, I can't believe in a God like that. Really? Like you got a choice. Yeah, you do for a period. Because whether you believe now or later, and I'm not talking about the candy, you will believe at some point. Because every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. You won't have a choice in that hour. You have a choice right now. He says, if my people, which are called by my name. Now, let's get it straight. Who are, who are the people, the ones that are called by his name? How are they going to be called by his name? The priests were responsible for putting the name of Jehovah on the people every time they pronounced the blessing. May Jehovah bless you. May Jehovah keep you. May Jehovah cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. This is putting the name of Jehovah on his people over and over and over and over and over and over to remind the people who they belong to, who you belong to. You are the property of the Almighty, your life. Now, you, people make these confessions. Well, my life is not my own. Oh, yeah, well, why you do, what, what you doing up in the bar? Are you in there sharing the good news? Why are you at that concert? Jehovah's not being glorified. I'm thankful for the sake of some people that the Super Bowl is not on Shabbat. Really? You will have a lot of backslide messianics. It'd be a big mess. Seriously. Because you got some, you got some devout Christians who are going to backslide tomorrow. They're going to skip church. Because it's the Super Bowl. The national religion for the sports fanatic. That is the high holy day of holy days. They've been preparing for this just like people prepare to go up to Jerusalem. All year long, looking as to who they're going to worship. And you know, I never made a connection. I never made a connection. See, the Bible says that we are to lift up holy hands. You know, I'm, I'm watching some of these, these concerts and they're, and they're not singing about Jesus. They're not singing about Yeshua. They're not singing about Jehovah. And you got people going. It's like, what y'all doing? You see, that's a, that's a posture of worship, ladies and gentlemen. Why you, who are you lifting your hands up to? They're idols. They're American idols. Oh, so you think you can dance? Ladies and gentlemen, the world is getting more and more perverted every day. Seriously. It is getting so outrageously perverted to where the devil has come out the closet and the believers have gone in. It's 
If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. First, they got to humble themselves. Then they got to pray. Now, you can pray without seeking his face. Now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to take. Amen. Did you just seek the face of the Almighty or did you just pray? Father, I ask your blessings upon this food. May it be nourishment in my body. May you cleanse it of all impurities in Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. See, people can pray, but there's a difference between praying and seeking his face. So he says, if you humble yourselves, one, pray, two, seek my face, three. And here's the kicker. You got to do some repenting. You got to do some repenting. What do you repent from? Your wicked ways. What do you mean your wicked ways? I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot of fornicating Christians. A lot of them. Come out, I love the Lord. Well, who you sleeping with? Who you go? Well, we, 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 we engaged. Are you married? No, but we engaged. Are you married? Are you married? And you know you got families, families. You know your daughter, you know your son out there fornicate. You know it. And you tell them about it. And it just goes in one ear and out the other. And you embrace them like they ain't fornicating because that's your baby. Talking about you keep the law. That ain't law abiding right there. Do you understand what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? There are times where the word says you got to cut some people off. Well, what if that, that's my baby? Well, you ain't dedicated that boy or that girl to the Almighty. That's your baby, not his. That's your baby, not his. Because when you dedicate that child to him, then you are committed to training that child up the way they should go. And if they don't want to live according to what you have trained them up, they should be ashamed to come around you. And you should not make it easy for them. Your presence should bring conviction just like the presence of the Almighty should. And if you compromise because it's your baby, don't think for a moment the Almighty is going to compromise with you. I know it's hard. I know it's hard, ladies and gentlemen. But he didn't call this to be easy. Because after all, it's him who's taking them into bondage. It's him who's taking them into captivity. It's him who's sending the, the locusts to devour the land. I'm going to tell you something. If you got somebody in your house that's going to cause the locust to come, then guess what? You will suffer the consequences of the locust just like that hard-headed son or daughter you're harboring. You're harboring a, cri a criminal. Not in man's law. And you got these, these individuals. Listen, I, I know this is not pretty. But it wasn't meant to be pretty. Jehovah didn't make it. He's not making allowances for you and I. He's holding you and I according to his word and says, listen, I am no respecter of person. Don't you think for a moment just because you say you love me that I'm going to overlook your wrongdoing. Now, there is a responsibility. There is a responsibility that you and I both have. Our role is to teach them. But before you can teach them, you have to believe it. And if you believe it, you're going to walk in it. And if you walk in it because you believe it, anybody who comes into your presence is going to be convicted because of your belief. 
in which you are walking. So they're not going to bring foolishness to your house unless you allow it, unless you compromise, unless you permit it. Father is calling us to a higher standard. That's what he's calling us to. This is not for the faint at heart. It's not for the weak. It's not for the folks who want to play church. It's not for the folks who want to believe but not do. Because this is going to call all of us out. He says, then, if you humble yourselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, any one of us who have been in any prayer meeting, in any church, for any period of time, have heard somebody pray this prayer. And the majority of the people that we've heard pray these prayers are not turning from their wicked ways. So they expect the Almighty to heal their lands without them repenting. That's the prayer, which is an indication they're not seeking the face. They're just praying. <laughs> you got people who will pray, but they won't seek the face of the Almighty because when you seek the face of the Almighty, guess what? He shows up. And one of the first things he, show, one of the first things he does when he shows up is show you your wickedness. That's what he does for me. Every time I get in his presence, he's... He, He's not talking to me about my wife. I can't remember once. I remember, I do remember, I'm talking to him about my wife, and he's talking to me about what I need to do to get her back. But it's what I need to do, not what she needs to do. You get it? He's always dealing with you about what you need to do. Because if you will do what you're supposed to do, he will honor you in your obedience to him. He will change. He can change. My wife wanted nothing to do with me. I had preachers, ministers, elders, deacons telling me, man, you might as well give it up because she's done with you. You'd have messed up so bad, and I don't blame her for not wanting you back. But I caught as if there was, I didn't even know anything about the horns of the altar. But I grabbed a hold of something. I grabbed a hold of his toe, a toenail or something. Listen. <laughs> and, and, and see, I can tell you, I've seen the Almighty turn hard hearts. I've seen it. He hold the hearts of men and women in his hand. It wasn't about me trying to tell my wife how wicked she was, how she wasn't submitting to my authority. She could care. She, she didn't care about that. She really didn't. What authority? You ain't got no authority here. I got a restraining order. I'm the authority here. <laughs> Your authority over there. Now go on back over there because you don't belong here. Don't make me call the police because they'll come and take you to jail. That's the way it was. So I had to grab a hold of him over at my house to get him to deal with her over there at his house, uh, at her house, and trust that he was doing it. And I'll tell you, by sight, didn't look like he was doing it. But I remember the day the sun came out. And there was a glimpse that maybe he is over there doing something. <laughs> Are you hearing me, ladies and gentlemen? Father knows how to change. He can take the heart. He can harden the heart. He can soften the heart. But what he's asking you to do is that, and every one of us should be looking about how we can find favor in the eyes of the Almighty. Remember the prophets, you know, they would, they would simply say, if, 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 if I have found favor. See, that's when you get to the negotiating table. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You can negotiate with Jehovah. But it's not going to be based on you not willing to live according to his commands. 
when you align yourself with the commands of the Almighty, you can go into his presence and you can ask him, if I found favor in your sight. Now, I, I'm, I'm doing what you're telling me to do. I'm examining my life. You're showing me where my, where my wrongs are, where my faults are. If I find favor, see, this is where you can begin to talk about the desires of your heart. You've delighted yourself in him. You're meditating on his commands, his laws. You're living according to what you believe he's telling you to believe in. And you're petitioning him. You know, I'm looking for favor. Every one of us should be looking for favor in his sight. Now mine eyes, he says, then will I hear from heaven. Then, when? When they humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. Repent. Turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. Now, what I'm dealing with here, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, is what you need to know, one, not to go into bondage. And if you've gone into bondage, what you need to do when he deliver you from bondage. See, when we talk about the house being swept and garnished, when the strong man has been put out, when those spirits have been driven out and they're going through dry, arid places and they're looking for rest, and when they come back and find that house swept and garnished, to this day, we've got all kinds of revelations of what that means. Filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of you have ever seen people speaking in tongues filled with the Holy Spirit fall short of the glory? Find themselves in sinful conditions, sinful practices. You hear what I'm saying? Just because you're filled with the Holy Spirit, understand this. The Holy Spirit will reveal the mind of Jehovah. Your spirit reveals your mind. And therefore, when the Holy Spirit comes in, there is a fight going on for this territory. This is your land. This is the land that needs to be healed. So the Holy Spirit comes in and he's got to deal with you. This is what Paul talks about in Romans when he says, there's a war going on in my members. The good that I want to do is not what I find myself doing. The stuff that I don't even want to do is what I find myself doing. And I find that there's a war going on in my members where I would do good. Evil is always present. So I find myself in the same predicament as Cain. I must master sin. I must master sin. Me. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that is totally submit myself to his will and embrace the freedom that he's given me in keeping his commandments. I'm, I'm about to bring this to a close. Now my eyes shall be open and my ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now, I have chosen and sanctified this house. See, you never get to this part of the prayer in the church. You never get to this. You, you, you hear, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven. Wait a minute, you left out that other part. And turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and heal their land or forgive their sins and heal their land. That's about it. But guess what? Don't shut him off. Jehovah's still talking. He didn't, finish, he, didn't, he didn't give the benediction. He's still talking. Now, he says, my eyes shall be open. And what land is he talking about? He's not talking about America. Now, there are people who are trying to make America the promised land. Make America the new Jerusalem. Make America the apple of God's eye. It ain't happening. 
And you can read about the harbinger all you want. It ain't happening. America is not the promised land. Jehovah is not going to touch down in America when Yeshua comes. He's not going to build his temple in New York. He's going to be the temple in the new city, the new Jerusalem. Are you hearing me, ladies and gentlemen? Now you can say this is a Christian nation. You can say all this. Well, we're the only allies of the Jewish people. So what? Let me tell you. Let's keep reading here. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Where? That's my house. Now. And as for thee, Let's deal with you, Solomon. If you will walk before me as David, thy father, walked and do according to all that I've commanded thee and shalt observe my statutes and my judgments, then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom according as I have com covenanted with David, thy father, saying, there shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in America. In Israel, but if you turn away and forsake my statutes, now I love you, but if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck them up by the roots out of thy land, which I have given them, and this house, which I have sanctified for my name, will I cast them out of my sight, and I will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. Now, what is he saying? I'm going to destroy this house. I'm going to take the people and I'm going to cast them out of the land. And this house, this elaborate place that you built for my name, that I put my name on, is coming down. Now, that's exactly what happened to Solomon's temple. The people were carried away into Babylon. They came out of Babylon, built Zerubbabel's temple. And the people began to worship idols and embrace paganism. So much so to where they allowed Antiochus to come in and defile the place. Now there's a need to be rededicated. And after that, the Hasmonean dynasty ended and the Herodian dynasty began and Herod built the temple that was in the land when Yeshua was there. And one day while he was leaving, he said every brick, every stone, there will not be one stone left upon another. Today we have the Welling Wall. The Welling Wall is a sign of what used to be. It is the byword. That's hard for some people to embrace. But the fact of the matter is, Jehovah allowed, not only did he allow, he called Babylon. Listen, my people have gone into idolatry. I told them what I was going to do when they did that. Come get them. Take them away. They wouldn't observe my Sabbaths. They wouldn't let the land rest. They wouldn't keep my statues. Take them away and have them serve your gods. Hopefully they'll make a distinction between who is God. Who is the real? May the real Jehovah show up. They cried and he delivered. And guess what? Bam. Back into captivity. And now Yeshua is coming to the remnant, to the seed of Abraham, who is not serving the Almighty. He said, the word is not in you. Your daddy is the devil. 
You've established a system of religion and he ain't in it. And the disciples, look at how beautiful this place is. Yeah, but it's not going to last. Why? Because some people want to say, well, because he didn't want temple worship, he didn't want temple service. Let me tell you something. There will, according to prophecy, be another one. But from the first one, because we don't see Jehovah putting his name on the second one or the third one. He did put his name on one. And that was out of respect for David, out of respect for Abraham. But today, he says, I'll cast you out of my sight. I will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. And this house, which is high, shall be an astonishment to everyone that passes by it. So that he shall say, why has the Lord done thus unto this land and unto this house? They call it the welling wall because people are welling at it. They're welling and they're crying out to Jehovah while at the same time refuse to let Yeshua in the land. Not only is Yeshua not welcome there, but anyone who confessed Yeshua is not welcome there, except these Christian tourists who want to bring in millions and millions and millions of dollars to prop up the economy. That's what's going on. It's tourism. The Holy Land ain't holy. But people have fallen in love with the concept and ignoring the word. The only thing that is going to change that land is Jehovah Almighty when the people who are called by his name humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. Judaism is not the religion of the Bible. Judaism is the religion of the Jews. Jehovah is not in Judaism. I don't care what anybody say to you. Yeshua says beware of the leaven. Beware of the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That is Judaism. How can you deny people returning to the land because they say they believe in Yeshua. And how can you support a system that rejects Yeshua, but allow Christ, who reject the law, to come up and set up camp? See, Christ can come in, but Yeshua can't. And on Thursday, as Brother Kenny was ministering, I'm sitting there realizing that I'd allowed a stronghold to be established. Let me finish this, this last verse, and I won't get to the other, but I want to finish it. And this house which is high shall be an astonishment to everyone that passes by it, so that he shall say, Why has Jehovah done thus unto this land and unto this house? Who did it? Jehovah did it. Why would, would you let, listen, listen, would you let somebody come into your house and destroy it? America, nor Israel, Israel now has one of the, the, the most powerful, actually, one of the most powerful armies in the Middle East. Hasn't always been that way, but it does. And you've got, you know, it's enemies who don't know what to do because it's not 
it's not that Jehovah is trying to protect the Jewish people as much as he is protecting his land. In order for him to protect his land, he had to get his people out of it. He says, you all have defiled the land. The land is an abomination. You're allowing every detestable thing to go on in the land. You're not letting the land rest. I'm going to send you all into Babylon so the land can get some rest. That's his land. And he's not going to allow someone to come in and take the land, but he will allow someone to come in and take the people. And he has done it. And he's still doing it. But the land is his. The earth is his. They is his. They that dwell in Babylon belongs to Jehovah. Rome belongs to Jehovah. Greece belongs to Jehovah. Assyria belongs to Jehovah. Iraq, Iran belongs to Jehovah. They are his ministers. We don't like, like hearing it, but it's the truth. He has used these anti-God people to discipline his people. He brought Babylon in. He brought Assyria in. He sent them to Egypt and delivered them out of Egypt. He allowed Rome to come in. You understand what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? It's his land. And it's the apple of his eye. And he's not going to allow anybody to do whatever they want to do. But he's always teaching his people a lesson. And here's the lesson. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my commandments and enjoy peace. Keep my commandments and stay protected. Keep my commandments and live a life that I'm going to watch over you and provide for you and take care of you. You don't? Then I got news for you. I'm going to show you the difference between a holy God and an unholy one. I am the only wise one there is. You shall not have any other before me, and yet people in their ignorance put other gods before him when he says, don't do it. He says, this house will be, which is high, shall be an astonishment to everyone that passes by it, so that he shall say, why has the Lord done thus unto this land and unto this house? And it shall be answered. Here's the answer. This is why he allowed it to happen. Because they forsook Jehovah. Elohim of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt and laid hands on and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this evil upon them. Who brought the evil on them? Jehovah did. And you can't bless what he ain't blessed. You can't change what he ain't changed. Just as he has protected, covered, delivered, and sent into bondage, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And our job is to get on his side. And whoever is on his side, just like Moses said, those of you who are on the Lord's side, y'all stand over here. We're going to make a distinction between those of you who are with Jehovah and those of you who are playing lip service. Just, just stand over here. Because this is exactly what's going on right now, ladies and gentlemen is that Jehovah's judgment is on the earth. And it's going to begin where? With his people. He always deal with his people first. You see, he didn't, he didn't give Satan or the serpent instructions. He gave Adam and Mrs. Adam instruction. And by by the way it seemed like it went down, he first dealt with Mr., then he dealt with Miss, and then he dealt with the serpent. It was the serpent who beguiled the woman. 
Seemed like the serpent would have been judged first. But Jehovah is always dealing with his people because regardless to what the world is out there doing, you should know better because you have my word, the world don't. Your responsibility is to get the word to the world. I can't judge the world that doesn't have my word, which is why I've commissioned you to get the word to the world so that I can judge the world when it's time. But let me tell you this. Even when the word get to the world, judgment is going to start in his house. So because they did this. On Thursday, I was sitting there as Brother Kenny was ministering. And prior to him ministering here, we'd had a, a long conversation on the telephone as he was sharing with me about things that are not only happening in the land of Israel, but also the things that are happening in Messianic communities around the globe, around the country, rather. And Kenny does extensive traveling. He's going to be going over. I mean, Kenny is an international person, and I mean, he does a lot of travel. He sees a lot of things, and, and I believe Father's given him a unique perspective on how to see and in cases how to address. But one of the things that, that was said, and those of you who you, you can see that several weeks ago, a declaration was made by the Prime Minister of Israel to, and, and, and he said that his, his whole mission was to make Israel a Jewish state. It is not the will of Jehovah for Israel to be a Jewish state. That's not his will. The fact that they're trying to make the land of Israel a Jewish state is an oxymoron. Because the fact of it is, is that you can't make Israel Jewish. Only Judah. Judah's only one tribe. You can't take the land that the Almighty has given to the 12 tribes of Israel and let one tribe hog it. Jehovah's got to deal with that. And so you got a prime minister who says that his mission in life is to make Israel a Jewish state. And within a few days of that declaration, the entire Knesset crumbled. Now, for those of you who want to watch prophecy, because you got people who want to put, you know, whatever happens in America is because of America's response to Israel. Why don't you judge that? The government crumbled, forced new elections. Where does that find its way in biblical prophets? Oh, don't touch that, brother. You can't talk about Israel. <laughs> That's the Jewish people. That's God's people. Listen, I'm as much God's people. You are as much God's people as anybody over there in that land. And that's where my conviction came. Because I personally, have become so frustrated with the fact that if I or any of you want to make Aliyah to go there and live, that you would have to denounce Messiah. You would literally have to reject the Messiah in whom you have put your hope in order to go to the land that you and I have been vowed by the Almighty to inherit. That land is as much as my land as any Jew. That would be like your parents dying and your sister or your brother taking all the land, all the inheritance, and not give you nothing. And this is the kind of stuff that has happened over the course of history, which has caused fighting between Ephraim and Judah and Simeon and Judah and all of the tribes. They have fought among themselves. Even at war with each other. 
because of one tribe trying to usurp authority over another tribe when Jehovah equally divided the land among all the tribes. With the exception of Levi, who was supposed to be Jehovah's inheritance. And these strongholds have been carefully articulated and manipulated and fortified in the mind of people to where today you have people who claim to love Jehovah, who says that they must support Israel. What Israel are you supporting? What are you supporting? Because if you're talking about a land that rejects the Messiah and the people who claim to be of Messiah, then what are you supporting? You're supporting an anti-Messiah government, which is no better than the government of this United States. But we're supposed to love Israel. Well, who is Israel? See, just because someone confessed to be a Jew outwardly doesn't make them one inwardly. And this is not a message against Jews or Judaism. You can twist it, you can bend it, however you want, but that's not what this is about. The conviction in my heart is that I have as much right as a representative of the kingdom for citizenship in that land. Who is the Knesset? To deny, to deny me right to that which my Elohim says I am supposed to inherit. What give these individuals the right to take my birthright? I've been born into the kingdom. I have as much right as anyone else. But it wasn't them taking my birthright. It was me forfeiting my birthright. That's where I got convicted that I just forfeited my birthright because of what I've seen with my eyes. That there's a people who are there that don't look nothing like me, and it's not a black thing, it's not a white thing. But when you begin to, when you begin to look at biblical prophecy, you begin to see some things, things that right now I have to be careful of how I even communicate because I'm already labeled. But the day is coming. The day is coming. Because we have to call things out because you got talking heads running around the country selling a bill of goods that is just as anti-counterfeit. I mean, it is counterfeit to the max. And you got people who are buying their books and perpetuating their doctrines trying to make America God's country. But you and I, if we believe what the Bible says, and this is the thing, ladies and gentlemen, we can believe in God and not believe the word. Are you grafted in or not? Hello? Are you? So what are you grafted into? You're grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. You now are fellow citizens if you believe the word. You are a fellow citizen. Oh, is that just spiritual? So you can go to heaven? No. You have as much right to the promises that Jehovah gave to Abraham as anyone else. This is why he boldly declared that there is one Torah, not two. You can call yourself a goy. You can call yourself a Gentile. You can call yourself whatever you want. But the fact of the matter is, what does he call you? And that's where the distinction comes in. Do you believe his word or do you believe what you believe? Because he says that you are now grafted into the commonwealth of Israel, you are no longer an alien. You're no longer a foreigner. You are a fellow citizen. You have as much right to this land as anyone else has to this land. And who has the authority and the right to tell you, you can't 
have what Jehovah said is yours. Who's got that authority? But if they could get into our heads, if the propaganda can get into your head and convince you, oh, I'm not Jewish, so? So what? Neither is Simeon, neither is Dan, neither is Ephraim, neither is any of the tribes other than Judah. Even Benjamin is not Jewish, they're Benjamites. You understand what I'm saying? So we've allowed words to twist our thinking and these words have created strongholds in our minds to cause us to see ourselves as people of the book, but disconnected from the book, claiming the promises, but not embracing the promises, and therefore rejecting our birthrights. That's what the Almighty, he says, boy, you done rejected your birthright. Don't do that. Don't be like, don't be like Esau. Don't be like him. So how can I be like Esau? Esau gave up his birthright for some soup. What are you getting at the deal? And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, I have as much right. Now the gospel becomes even clearer because we are going to bring them the same message Yeshua came to bring. The same message that Peter, James, and John, and the apostles came to bring to a people who have a system of religion that have allowed their religion to be their religion, and the religion is simply to fortify the Jewish religion or the homeland of the Jews. See, Judaism is not about serving the Almighty. It is a system that is designed and developed to keep the Jews in harmony with one another no matter where they are. And don't confuse Zionism with biblical Zion. Zionism is a political system. It is not biblical. At least not the Zionism that is there in the land. Zionism's sole mission is to establish a homeland for the Jews, and by establishing a homeland for the Jews, that means that those who do not convert to Judaism will have right to the land that Jehovah said is ours. And I know it's tough. It's all right. Strongholds. These things go so deep, so deep, sometimes we don't even know how deep they've gotten. And before you know it, we see religion and the word through these religious systems that causes us by default to not believe what the word clearly says we are to believe. And therefore, we become religious people, not believers, believing in him, but not believing his word. I've chosen today, and every time he showed me an area where I have an area where I'm not necessarily believing, my job is to repent. But I also realize that where he shows me that he also is dealing with others. And where he's not dealing with others, as one who has a voice for him, is my responsibility to tell people what he's saying, what he's saying to me. And if it resonates with you, then there's a good chance he's speaking to you. If it doesn't, you can reject it. Just act like I haven't said anything this whole time. That's up to you. But what I dare what I dare you at is don't just discount it. Don't discount it. 
I wanted to, and we won't get into it, but I want you to get into it because this is so important. I was going to read Deuteronomy 28, chapter 15 through 68. I've chosen not to do it because we are out of time. But I need you to read it. I did a teaching on the 28 blessings of Deuteronomy 28 because I did not want to go into the curse side of Deuteronomy 28. But it is important that we don't read simply Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68 deal with the curses, and the curses are those things that are associated with the violation of the law. This is the futility and the vanity of those who are seeking worldly fame. Because in order to accomplish worldly fame, in order to become famous, in order to become rich and famous, one believes that they have to abandon the commandments of God. They believe that they cannot play by his rules and be successful. The only way you're going to truly be successful is play by his rules. Because what profits a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What's the, but, what's the point in having all kinds of money and you got to ride around in a bulletproof car? What's the point? What's the point? What's the point in having all, all these resources and you got to be afraid of somebody kidnapping your son, kidnapping your daughter, breaking into your home, kidnapping you, ransoming you because of your stuff. What's the point of having all this stuff and can't sleep at night? What's the point? See, people don't think about these things while they're in the pursuit of the stuff. But once they get the stuff, they realize the stuff don't fulfill them. Stuff will never fulfill you. Only Jehovah can give you the ability to enjoy the stuff you've worked for. Because if he don't give you the ability to enjoy it, you just got a bunch of stuff. And I know people got lots of stuff. Two and three airplanes. How many airplanes do you think you can be in at one time? How many cars do you think you can drive at one time? How many houses do you think you can live in? at once. How many rooms? <laughs> Hallelujah, somebody. So please, read Deuteronomy 28. Read verses 15 through 68. I don't intend. Last week, I was told that we, we broke a previous record, and I looked at the numbers that, that I was standing here for five, for five hours and 30. How many, how long was I, how long was, Five hours and 36 minutes last week. I don't plan on doing that today. I really don't. But the way I'm going, it looks like <laughs> it's not going to happen. So what I'm going to do now is, I, again, I want to encourage you to read Deuteronomy 28, chapter, 5, chapter 28, verses 15 through 68. It's important. It's very important that you read this. Because when Jehovah said to the children of Israel, he says, listen, everything in the earth is mine. I'm going to give it all to you, but here's what you have to do to keep it. You're going to have to watch yourself. You're going to have to keep my commandments. You're going to have to do what I tell you to do, and then you will prosper in the land. It's the same thing. The reason why I laid this out the way I did today is because next week we're going to get into how to receive. You're going to receive deliverance from strongholds. We're going to go right into it. But if you don't understand what I just shared with you today because the children of Israel was delivered only to be taken back into bondage and what took them into bondage the almighty delivered them into bondage what makes you and I think we're any different 
just as he delivered his people into bondage, he will deliver you and I. And Deuteronomy is a, a measuring, if you would, of which side of the commandments you're on. You should look at Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. Are you living there? And you should look at Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. Are you living there? Is there a mixture? Where are you? Because you need to know. And once you know, now you can begin to see where you might need some adjustments, which is why it's important for us to understand his commands. So please read it. That's your assignment for this week. You can say, well, I, you know, I don't know what to read. Well, I'm just telling you now. Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. And once you get through it, go back to Deuteronomy 28, verses 1, and read the whole chapter again. And I pray and hope that some of you, because I, I imagine while, while we were going through this, that some of you would begin to see some things that would hopefully convince you to deal with some of the areas and issues in your life that you have procrastinated in dealing with. You see, the beauty of Jehovah is that before he delivered his people into bondage, he always gave them warnings, even though he had clearly given them the, his word. But before he acted on his word to bring the captivity and to deliver them into bondage, he raised up prophets. He raised up individuals, sent them to the people, and gave them space to get it right. These messages are him giving us space to get it right. Now, you can choose to get it right or you can choose not to get it right. But let me tell you something. He gives us all the opportunity to get it right because he's merciful. He doesn't want to see you in bondage. He doesn't want to see you in captivity. He doesn't want to see you allowing strongholds to keep you out of the promises that he has ordained for you to walk in. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be whole. That's what the entire process, that's why Yeshua came, to make us whole. That means in every area of our lives, he wants you to be whole. He don't want you to be broke. Busted, disgusted. He don't want you to be sick. He don't want you to be bound. He don't want you to be in bondage. He don't want you to be in debt. He wants you to be a lender and not a borrower. Above only, not beneath. Blessed going in, blessed coming out. He wants you to be blessed in every area of your life. And if anything in your psyche is saying anything else other than that to you, there's a stronghold. I want you to be in health and prosper. And when we did the teaching on the, the true biblical prosperity, one of the things we identified is your prosperity and my prosperity is going to look different. You may only want a, 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 a Fiat <laughs> and a two-bedroom house on a corner lot. And if that's prosperity for you, all, all the power of Jehovah be upon you. But don't let somebody else's prosperity or you based on your idea of prosperity. Because you got people who say, they don't need all that. <laughs> that ain't your business. Do you have what you need? That's what you should be focusing on. Amen? Amen. And leave other people alone. Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that you've given us today. We so much appreciate it. As we're dealing with the issues of strongholds, we see that even how you've given your people your word and you've made specific promises that are associated in your word, that there's blessings that is associated with walking in obedience and there are curses that are associated with walking in disobedience. We also know that the way we think, the way we see things, and the way we formulated our way of outlook and how we address issues in our life is based on how we have come to think, which could very well be strongholds in our lives, how we govern our lives, how we see things, what we believe about ourselves, what we believe about you, what we believe about others, particular ethnic groups, particular nationalities, particular colors. 
And when we break it down, we see that there are issues that we have to deal with, especially, and we haven't dealt with the issue of race and prejudices. But we know, Father, that you have the authority and the right to reveal whatever it is that you want to reveal to each of us because you love us. You see the things that we need to deal with just as you saw the rich young ruler and what was in his heart. You see the things that are in our heart, the things that we hide from other people, the way we think, what we meditate on, what motivates us, what demotivates us. And we really desire for you to have your way because we say that we're yours. We say that we are the sheep of your pasture. We say that you are the great shepherd. We say that our lives are not our own. It was paid for, bought with a price. That we are the temple. We are to honor you with our body. We say all of these things. And I pray that you'll help us to mean these things so that we will walk in those things and not just give lip service. We know that there are areas and issues in our lives some we have had a hard time dealing with. Some things that have developed so much a stronghold that every time we think we've got it licked, it shows itself up all over again. As we begin to lay out what it takes to free ourselves from these strongholds and how to walk effectively in deliverance, I pray that you'll reveal yourself to us in mighty and powerful ways that we will literally have the strength that we need to walk out our deliverance and stay free as Messiah make us free. I bless your people. I thank you that you blessed us, that you sent Messiah to show us how to live free of bondage, free of captivity, and even to the point of setting others free. Help us to be about your business. Help us to be focused on your word, not on our religion or tradition. Help us to overcome our religious approach and even confront the strongholds that lie dormant in our minds as you expose them. I thank you that you love us so much to leave us not like you found us, but to change us, to deliver us, to Reveal yourself to us to show us that there's more that you would like to do to not be comfortable where we are. To be content, of course, but not to become complacent or cynical or judgmental. Help us to deal with the beam in our own eyes. Help us to evaluate our own lives. Father, I thank you, and I bless you in Messiah's name. Amen. For more information, visit www.arthurbaileyministries.com or call 888-899-1479. House of Israel International Services is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Thank you. Thank you.